right. Hi, I'm Jesse Brockman. And I'm Melissa Keenling. And we are presenting Fiat's uh, Chrysler's Reno merger proposal. So we're going to begin with information from the article for about the first half of the presentation. And then we're going to branch out to include information from outside sources for the second half. We thought we would start with the article summary. Our article was on Fiat Chrysler's Chrysler Automobiles proposed merger with their French rival Renault. This merger was worth approximately $40 billion. Fiat Chrysler is an Italian-American multinational corporation. You might know them as the maker of Jeeps and Rams. They are most prominently present within the US and they have a market value of approximately $22 billion. Whereas Renault as a French company is a multinational automobile manufacturer that produces a range of cars and vans. Whereas Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler is more prominent within the US, Renault is more present across Europe, Russia, Africa, and the Middle East. So it actually and makes two brands. Yeah, yeah, it, it would be um, it would be considered a market extension merger because they both serve different markets. So it would be beneficial for them to cover more area and service more locations across the world. And they're approximately the same size, so and both of a pretty decent size within the industry as well. So the merger would create the third largest automaker by production, which is pretty significant for not only the companies themselves, but also the customers and the automotive industry as a whole. So what would this proposed new company look like if the merger did go through? The Fiat Chrysler proposed that John Dominique Sennard be the chief executive of the new company, who is currently the chairman of Renault. They also suggested that John Elkin be a chairman, who is a fion of the Agnelli family that controls Fiat Chrysler. The Agnelli family controls 44% of its voting rights and owns 29% of the company. They want to keep it pretty balanced. So they want a 50-50% split with 50% owned by Fiat Chrysler's shareholders and 50% owned by Renault's shareholders. And the majority of the board for the new company would be independent. They also want to keep voting rights aligned with the respective economic shareholding, where the Agnelli family has a strong percent of ownership within Fiat Chrysler. The French government also plays a big role for Renault. So the Agnelli family would be down from 29% of Fiat Chrysler to 14.5% of the new company. And the French government would be down from owning 15% of Renault to 7.5% of the... So they would really be big shareholders who could influence that. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, they, uh, because they have such a big shareholding, they'd really be able to influence the uh, decision-making in the company. Yes, definitely. I mean, they obviously had significant shareholding within the individual companies and I think the hope is that some of that will go down with the new company so there is a chance for more big players to come into play and for there to be more of a say with other individuals within the new company but yes they would have they would still have a prominent say within the new company Okay, but it would be different than the existing one because the existing one had uh, in uh, Fiat Chrysler, the Elkins have 44%, so they'd actually have, or voting rights, 29 so they'd have a, a lot smaller role in this one. Okay. Yeah, so they would obviously have their own stance about the merger as well because that is a significant reduction within their ownership, mm -hmm. but they have to keep in mind the benefits of the merger for the company as a whole as well. If it did go through. 
So with all this information that was given to us, we were wondering why the new company's operational headquarters weren't disclosed by Fiat Chrysler. And we could only really make our own assumptions based on why this information would not be disclosed. It could be mm -hmm. as simple as, you know, the discussion with Renault being so new that they haven't just established that yet. But we also considered that they may be considering a location near a competitor's headquarters, which would um, increase direct competition for market demand in that area, if so. I so never that thought was, of that. Yeah, so we thought that it could be, you know, advantageous if said competitor was less aware of this until the merger was more substantial and they were ready to actually compete. Yeah, and we also, That's a different take. That's good. Okay, thank you. And we also considered that because a company's headquarters is where its executive management and key managerial and support staff are located, that if there is not a, an agreement with the key staff that Fiat Chrysler is originally suggesting, then this location may have to be changed. It may not be set in stone depending on what kind of changes may have to be made with the key staff. Uh -huh. And also the fact that Fiat, Chrysler, and Renault are currently located in different areas for their headquarters. So, okay. you know, it, it may be harder to determine where exactly to establish the new company. Okay. So, um, we looked into the status of the transaction and the three days ago. Um, so Fiat Chrysler proposed a roughly $40 billion merger to Renault. And as we touched on earlier, it appears to be a market extension because Fiat is iconic in Italy and Chrysler populates the US with Jeeps and Rams. And Renault has been a popular manufacturer in France since 1899 and extending the market geographically would be the main benefit of the merger. Um, if the merger was executed, this resulting company would be the third largest automaker by production in the world. Um, and that's pretty insane to be the third of anything in the world. So it's pretty much a huge takeaway from the article. So they're really expecting that there'd also be a lot of cost saves as they eliminate duplicity and shared technology that they could have? Oh yeah, they'd be able to um, use the technology that they were previously competing against and optimizing it okay. for like one uh, company. Okay. Um, and then for the rise in Fiat and Renault's shares, uh, Renault shares uh, rose 12% early on in the European trading in late May. And this could be due to high expectations and anticipated success. And it's important to note that the French government is the largest shareholder for Renault. Fiat shares rose 8% early on in late May. And then Fiat already had a successful merger with Chrysler, so there's higher confidence in this merger. Um, and if both companies' high executives were going to remain in their positions or end up in similar positions, and um, shareholders would prefer a little change in leadership and would just give overall confidence in us rise super shares. So will the merger help cope with fast globalizing markets and rapidly changing technology? In short, yes. Um, they branch out and reach a wider audience um, geographically and in general, actually. And we'd, they'd establish loyal customers that will purchase when new technology is being launched. The world is becoming more and more interconnected. So having uh, a company merge that's, that's mostly focused in the U.S. with somewhere in France or Italy is just such a huge area. And it's important to note that this is economies of scope and it's got economies of scale relating that back to financial statement analysis um, because of the outreach and quantity. And then as of June 19th, no progress has been made after 
uh, Fiat halted the merger altogether due to the French government. Um, I found an article and it basically stated the French government is the, the largest shareholder of Renault and they sought to delay um, to gain the explicit assent of Nissan. They wanted more ties to Nissan instead of um, Fiat. And Fiat blamed the pol political conditions in France. And actually, I was watching another presentation, and they touched on this too, where the French government is um, is putting out more regulations limiting globalized technology corporations. Mm. So that's really interesting. Yeah. And yeah. how it affects the uh, the automotive industry and sure. like this merger huh. that global effect. Interesting. But that's where you have a government, a significant shareholder can influence a company, especially when it's a government like that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do you think it's going and to it, actually go through? Um, I don't think it'll go through because, like the merger itself, um, just because the French government put that halt and they wanted to, they wanted to merge with Nissan instead. Um, and yeah, kind of got upset about that according okay. to some Bloomberg articles. But that's a good thing, though. But we, you're taking a look at it. That's what you want to do. Yeah. Good. All right. So after going through all that with that merger, we thought we would. Take a look at one of the other big players within the same industry, Honda, and note on whether or not they should be looking for a partner as well, because they have notably not been interested in gaining a partner. Honda itself is a Japanese multinational conglomerate corporation that manufactures automobiles, motorcycles, and power equipment. As you can see from the graph, from this 2018 U.S. automotive industry market share graph that I found, Honda is currently the sixth largest competitor within the industry, so they are doing well individually currently and has remained largely independent despite the growing popularity of mergers and partnerships within the automotive industry. Honda has decided, rather than focusing on external partnerships, to focus more on its interregional cooperation and coordination within its six regional global operations structure, as it has operations within Europe, Japan, North America, South America, China, and Asia. So it's hoping to keep up with its competitors by improving its internal functions and the functionality between its own sections rather than branching out. However, That's interesting. It makes the supply there. They incorporated others into the supply chain. And when they're doing things, they're sharing technology. That's really, I didn't know that. That's, that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. With all new things, it sounds like a lot of it is around the electric cars. The, mm -hmm. What they're working on the supercharger network. Yeah. Interesting. They have been, um, they have been more strongly opposed to partnerships so far than their other leading competitors within the industry. But despite that, there have been some other partnerships because as you can see, it has been very beneficial within the market as more demands come from for more technological advances and such, which require very large sums of money for development and such, it becomes apparent that they do, most of these companies have been benefiting from forming partnerships with others just to share the weight of the financial burden. And so Honda has jumped on board with some of that with Sense Time Group for the artificial intelligence of, I believe it was for the self-driving cars and SoftBank Corporation, hoping to improve the use of 5G mobile networks within their cars. 
and they also have formed many partnerships with General Motors throughout the past years. There has been speculation that if Honda was looking for a partner, that General Motors would be their main consideration for that. But I have also found articles that have stated that that merger wouldn't be likely to ever happen because they have very different corporate structures and it wouldn't be a good culture match. Between yeah, I was going to ask you that question. Is, how, uh, is, some, is, do you think Honda's reluctance to do too much is a cultural thing? I believe it may be. They're a very large corporation in and among themselves. And it does seem that they have a very specific focus on what they want to expand and how they want to operate. So I do believe that it may be difficult for them to find a corporation within the industry that had a culture that was complementary to theirs. Okay. So the culture in trying to put two organizations, we didn't ever touch on that, but really the two cultures of the organization would drive the real success, wouldn't it? Yes, definitely. I mean, they can be as successful individually as possible. They could be the two leading industry, two leading companies within the industry. But if the cultures don't match, then merging the two wouldn't be successful because they'd have conflicts internally that would stunt any growth and future prosperity within the new company. Okay. Do you think that same thing, the cultural thing, could happen between Fiat and uh, the Renault, which is sort of got, you got a little, I mean, the Fiat, you got the Italian culture, uh, mm -hmm. then the French got Renault, then you got part of the relationship with Nissan, which is Japan, and then you have the US of A. How do you mm -hmm. think that, would that get in the, would that be a, a benefit because of things? or? Do you think just the way we culturally approach, approach things could be different? I think it could definitely go either way if they weren't able, there are some cultural difference that, differences there and if they weren't able to overcome them, it could be very detrimental to the merger and the new company. But if they were able to overcome the differences and find a way to merge the cultures well, then I think they would see that it's highly beneficial to have some of those differences in perspectives and specialties going forward as having too much of the same ideology and, you know, thought process within the company could stunt growth. Yeah, good. I mean, it's a good idea. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And just also simply just listening to what employees and uh, executives are saying about um, the process of things and just being collaborative and not just kind of coming in and like, all right, guys, this is what we're doing and we're doing it this way and this is the only way we're going to do it because that mm -hmm. just won't be successful. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think they are a good at a good at least from like a size perspective i think they're a good match and they have a good opportunity for the merger to work out if they are willing to cooperate and listen to each other because they are roughly the same size and they yeah. do have a lot to bring to the table individually and market yeah so there would be less of that power struggle if one was substantially larger than the other as to whether it's two people coming together or whether one person buying another. Yeah. Totally different things, really, for sure. Okay. So, that was all we had for our presentation, but if anyone has any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Great. I think it was a great job. Thank you. I like the way you brought Hamdi in. I thought that was great. Thank so, you. Thank you. Okay.